Okay, so uh, we have the second talk by Professor P.S. Zikivi uh, from the University of Florida on uh, dark matter caustics. Uh, so, Professor Zikivi, I will be uh, uh, telling you when it is 20 minutes, and then uh, uh, after 25 minutes, we'll have questions. So, uh, the participants, you are requested to um, uh, drop your questions in the chat box. Uh, just like before, we'll take the questions at the end of the uh, talk by Professor Sikibi. So over to Professor Sikibi. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Hello, hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, having me as part of the conference and uh, for coming to my talk. I like to talk about caustics in dark matter, and I view them as a tool to tell us uh, about the distribution of dark matter and possibly even about the identity of dark matter. So as a first uh, statement, I would like to uh, say the following. Uh, we, have, we think generally that the dark matter is cold and collisionless. So certainly that's true for WIMPs, for axions, for sterile neutrinos. And uh, if this is so, we should expect that at any physical location, wherever you are on this planet or in the galaxy, if you were, if you had eyes to see dark matter, you would see a set of discrete flows with each one with its definite velocity and density. And also what you would have is uh, caustics, which are surfaces in the physical space distribution where the density diverges, quasi diverges. It doesn't actually go to infinity, but it becomes very large. So I like to start uh, with this. Uh, let's see how does this work. Oh, I first want to start with a picture of my former collaborator, uh, Jim Epser, because he is the one who taught me how to think about these things in an efficient way. Uh, so the first statement I like to uh, make is that we actually not intuitively equipped to think about. Uh, dark matter fluid, because the fluids we are used to are uh, collision-full fluids like water and air. Uh, dark matter is actually a collisionless fluid. And that means that to describe the fluid, you should have a phase space distribution. For an ordinary fluid, you have a physical space distribution. For example, you give the density and the velocity at any location, and that means you can evolve the fluid in time. Actually, for the dark matter fluid, you have to evolve it in phase space. Here is a picture of caustics, as we can see at the bottom of a swimming pool. I want to uh, explain why these caustics appear. If you have a sunny day and it is somewhat breezy so that the surface of the swimming pool has waves, uh, light, a light font, which is the red line uh, at the top coming from the sun will get by refraction. When it arrives to the, at the bottom of the pool, it will get folded because this light ray goes over here and this light ray goes over there. And so the light goes back and forth at the bottom of the pool. And where it falls, actually, the density of light uh, diverges as, as a consequence. So if you go across one of these lines, the light actually goes this way and goes back that way and then goes back this way. And where it falls back and forth, you have an infinite, formally infinite um, density of light. This would be in the limit where the sun is a mass point. This is a point source, I should say. So we know about caustics very well. They are common in the propagation of light. Uh, rainbows, twinkling of stars, shimmering of the sea, uh, all examples. And of course, we know about caustics and gravitational lensing. The two ingredients that are necessary for and sufficient, actually, for this to happen is the fluid must have a collisionless flow. And this is true in the case of light because it can go through itself. That's being collisionless. 
and then it must have small velocity dispersion. In the case of light from the sun, this means that initially all the light comes from the same direction. You will not see this phenomenon of caustics on a cloudy day because on a cloudy day, the light comes from all directions. In a sunny day, the light comes directly from the sun. And I call that small velocity dispersion. Now, we don't see caustics in the flow of water or even the flow of um, air, or actually sometimes you see them in the flow of birds. Uh, the reason is that ordinary matter collides with itself, cannot go through itself. But if you consider cold dark matter, it has the two properties for making caustics. It is collisionless, it flows through itself and it has negligible primordial velocity dispersion. So you should expect caustics in cold dark matter. Now it's difficult to visualize uh, phase space because it's six dimensional, but we can have here a little two dimensional example. Even that you have to get used to it. Phase space has a physical direction X and it's associated velocity. I have put here a bunch of particles on a line. The, the red line represents dark matter particles. On the left, uh, this, uh, these particles have a density, which is the projection of the phase space sheet onto physical space. And it is given at the bottom. At every location, there is a single velocity. But as this evolves, it becomes what's shown on the right. This line falls or goes back and forth. And now at the middle location, there are three different velocities, actually three different flows. And where the line falls back, the density diverges because the line runs parallel to the velocity direction. And you can show that the typical divergence is a square root, one upon square root divergence. If X naught is the place where the line falls back, the density approaching the line uh, goes like one upon the square root of the distance to the line. So thus uh, equipped, we give ourselves the tremendous task of trying to this, uh, guess what is the distribution of cold dark matter in a, in the universe. Let's start with a homogeneous universe, one with constant density. So uh, I can again only show two on a slide. I can only shoot, show two uh, phase space directions, say some direction Z and its associated velocity. Because of the Hubble flow, the velocity is proportional to the distance. And so we have a line that is inclined this way. And it has a certain thickness, which is the velocity dispersion. And this velocity dispersion is very small for cold dark matter candidates. For example, for winds 10 to the minus 12, the speed of light for uh, KV mass neutrinos is 10 to the minus eight. And for axions, it's essentially zero. Uh, it is much less than even for WIMPs. Now, the actual universe is not homogeneous. It has density perturbations. And what that means is that this line, the surface, this three-dimensional, the, 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 the particles lie on a three-dimensional surface in six-dimensional phase space. This, uh, and I'm only showing a two-dimensional cut of phase space. This line becomes wiggly because of the density perturbations and actually the wiggles grow. They become bigger and bigger and at the location of a galaxy or some other large object, the phase space sheet begins to uh, wrap itself up. This is because around an attractive potential uh, center of force, phase space will always rotate clockwise. And for gravity, because the gravitational force decreases with distance, it rotates more quickly at the center than on the outside. And so it gets wrapped up. And after a while, it's wrapped up like this. So here I show 
um, picture, of course, it's a mind picture uh, of the phase space distribution of a large object like a galaxy. And the phase space sheet has wrapped up many times. And what does it mean? It means if you are inside this galaxy, you'll have at any location, a set of flows. Uh, here, you, so let's say this dashed line on the left is the, your location in the galaxy. You have a flow of particles falling in for the first time and going by you at the bottom here. Uh, let's see here at the top, you have a flow of particles that fell in from the opposite side of the galaxy and they go back outside and they're going by you. And then here they fell in and out and now in again. And you have another flow and you have all these flows corresponding to the number of times dark matter particles can reach you from the far past. So the this is really what I said at the start of the talk at any physical uh, point and you must have a discrete velocity distribution and you must have caustics where the number of flows changes. And I think this is an absolutely rigorous statement, as rigorous as any you can make in the discussion of dark matter. Now, let's say more things about this. Uh, how many flows are there is an important question. Well, it depends where you are in the halo, but at all location, the number of flows is of order 100. 100 being the age of the universe divided by the oscillation time in uh, the Milky Way halo with amplitude or location, or the time actually to go around once uh, the disk of our galaxy. The time to go around once is about 10 to the eight years and the age of the universe is about 10 to the 10 years. The ratio is 100. So there are about 100 flows at the location. So actually uh, many more than I showed. Now you may be concerned that the flows are not pristine and cold uh, because of hierarchical structure formation, but that is of course an issue, but you have to keep in mind uh, that uh, even so you'll have these cold flows. So here I have a cartoon where I have various structures falling in, but at present, when you look at the Milky Way halo, there's no large structures falling in. Maybe at most they have the structures there are, I have a velocity dispersion of order 10 kilometers per second. That is much less than the overall velocity dispersion of the halo, which is of order 300 kilometers per second. And remember that the velocity space is three dimensional. So basically the velocity space of our Milky Way halo is a cube, thousand kilometers per second on the side. And if you have hundred flows with, with 10 kilometers per second, they are well separated. And that is actually the relevant notion when you talk about these flows. We're concerned that the dark matter falling into the galaxy will get scattered by gravitational scattering. This is actually the point on which I collaborated with Jim Ipsen in 19.2 a long time ago. And we showed that this does not happen. If you consider the inhomogeneities that are now to be in our galaxy, they do not scatter the flow. Uh, you have inhomogeneities that are stars, molecular clouds, globular clusters, but uh, although they scatter the flows, diffuse the flows, this diffusion is not completed. It would take uh, 10 to the six times the present age of the universe for them to get diffused entirely. Then you may wonder, uh, what about n-body simulations? Well, I like to say about n-body simulations that although they have many bodies, perhaps 10 to the eight, actually most of them per galactic halo have less than 10 to the eight. That is actually a small number of bodies because phase space is six dimensional. So when you take the six square root of 10 to the eight, you get 21. 
So the number of bodies you have per dimension of phase space is 21. That's very poor resolution. And also because the mass of a halo is of order 10 to the 13 solar masses for Milky Way. The mass per particle is of order 10 to the five solar masses, which is enormously larger than the mass of any dark matter particle. Uh, say WIMP or Axion or Sterile Neutrinos. It's actually 54 orders of magnitude or 67 or whatever. So actually the N-body simulations don't have enough particles to resolve the expected flows and caustics. But here is actually a real simulation. This is an observation of a um, elliptical galaxy that apparently has in the recent past uh, captured a nearby galaxy, has stretched it in phase space in phase space, the stars from the captured galaxy were stretched and then folded up like I showed. And when you project this onto physical space in the sky, you have these ripples. And actually you can show, reproduce the appearance of these ripples by simulation. So this actually shows that of course, this is not dark matter, these are stars, but stars of mass of water, that of the sun, actually behave in a collisionless fashion and make caustics. The dark matter in this galaxy that got cap captured should be distributed like the stars and make the same caustics. Okay. Now, When dark matter falls into gravitational potential well, and it flows in and out, it makes caustics on the outside because it reaches a maximum radius before falling back in. What is perhaps not so obvious, but I think you can convince yourself of this in a less than an hour, is that the flow of particles falling into the galaxy and back out must also make a caustic. And we investigated the possibilities with Arvind Natarayan. And uh, first of all, we showed that there must be inner caustics as well as outer caustics. So the outer caustics are these shells that I showed and the inner caustics are near the center where the particles go through and make a caustic before going back out. When the initial velocity field of the dark matter falling in has rotation, the inner caustic is something that we call a trica spring. And to show how this happens, I consider a shell here shown in black falling in to the galaxy and then falling back out. And I'm assuming that these particles are rotating, the shell is rotating while it falls in and out. And you can see that this shell goes to some sequence A, B, C, D, E, F. The top falls down, the bottom falls up. And the caustic, the inner caustic is made right here and right there. The shell turns itself inside out because the particle that's initially inside will end up on the outside. When the sphere turns itself inside out, you can try, you must make a crease. And that's where the caustic appears. The caustic, okay, here is actually a more detailed description. This shell goes to the sequence one, two, three, four, five, and it makes the caustic here the dashed line. In fact, uh, this caustic is a non catastrophe in three dimensions called the elliptic umbilic. So the lines here show the trajectories of particles near the caustic and uh, the density blows up at the envelope of these lines. 
if you want to see it in three dimensions, here is a, a bracelet in the form of a caustic ring. Arvind uh, did simulations of this. So he had particles falling in, in the gravitational potential well, and they were at angular momentum. And here is this caustic ring in the limit of uh, uh, axial symmetry. Somehow he stretched the vertical direction uh, to show it perhaps more clearly. Uh, this, sorry, this object is stable. Caustics are stable. If you uh, perturb the flow or you perturb the gravitational potential, the caustic, of course, will lose its symmetry and so forth. But uh, the structure of the caustic does not change. Now, this is the case where the particles fall in with overall rotation. Uh, if, the, if the velocity field is irrotational, then the caustic is different and it has a shape like that. We call it a tent-like caustic. So this is the case for rotational flow. This is the case for irrotational flow. Now, uh, we have five minutes away from crossing 25 minutes. We have five minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I wanted to say that uh, we predicted uh, this actually work with Igert, Kachov, and Yun Wang on the basis of self similarity, where these particles uh, approach their uh, smallest radius, where are these caustics? And they have the caustics are in the galactic plane and they have radii of order 40 kiloparsec divided by n in our galaxy. So 40 kiloparsec, 20, 13.3, and 8, and so forth. And uh, I've claimed uh, that there's observ observational evidence for this. A lot of the evidence is based upon the fact that when you place a caustic ring in the disk of a galaxy, the rotation curve of the uh, galaxy gets perturbed by the presence of the caustic ring and has these kinks. For example, here is the rotation curve of our uh, neighbor Andromeda. And it has bumps over here, over there, and over there. And with uh, collaborators, Chakrabarty, Han, Gonzalez, we pointed out that these bumps actually, their radii, are in the ratios uh, one, one half, one third. So 30 kiloparsec divided by two is 15 kiloparsec divided by t uh, three is 10 kiloparsecs and so forth. Mm -hmm. So we tentatively propose these bumps are caused by caustic rings. One thing I like to emphasize about this is this outer bump here is enormous. It has a diameter of 60 kiloparsec. It is much bigger than the disc of M31. And it appears on both sides because the red curve and the blue curve correspond to different opposite sides of the galaxy. So you have a bump on one side of Andromeda, 30 kilopas per sec on the right, and you have another one, 30 kiloparsec on the left. And uh, that strongly implies that there's a ring structure in um, Andromeda. Now there's more evidence for this. I, I guess I'm running out of time uh, from rotation curves of other galaxies, uh, from the other rotation curve of our galaxy. I'm going very fast now. And also from the inner rotation curve of our galaxy. Our galaxy has a, a series of sharp rises in its rotation curve. And the positions of these rises are more or less consistent with the um, predictions of the caustic ring radii. The radii are shown by this 
predictions are shown by these vertical lines and the rises are the slanted lines. But also you may hope to see a caustic because if the caustic is in the uh, galactic plane, you may hope to see looking in the tangent direction, the imprint of the caustic onto the baryonic matter in the galactic disk. And I claim there is such an imprint and it, it makes a triangle seen in the uh, observation of the IRIS. Uh, IRIS uh, is an astronomical satellite looking in the infrared. Some of you may not see this directly, so I'm pointing at the vertices here. And here is at a different frequency. Now, more recently with Chakrabarti, Han and Gonzalez, uh, because for the longest time, there was no such triangle on the other side. So people said, oh, you see a triangle on the left, but you should see a triangle on both sides. Actually, this changed with Gaia, because Gaia has a triangle on both sides. So here's the Gaia sky map, and it has the triangle so the, on the left, but it also has a triangle here on the right. This is the triangle on the left. I put the little ver where the we think the vertices are, and here there's a new triangle on the right. I don't know whether you see it there. So we think uh, the caustic rain here is manifested in the flow of dust and taint by the dark matter. If this is correct, we actually inside this tricusp figure. And you can, then there are four flows associated with the uh, caustic ring at all location. And you know more or less well their velocity directions and they have very large densities. The largest one is the big flow and its density is roughly 40 times larger, 40 times larger than the standard estimates of the local dark matter density. So let me conclude, I guess my time is up. Uh, I think discrete flows and caustics are a robust prediction of cold dark matter cosmology. There is observational evidence for caustic rings. And uh, one thing we can conclude from this, because there are rings, caustic rings, that the dark matter falls in to the galaxy with a rotational velocity field. If the velocity field is irrotational, you will not make these links. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sikivi, for the talk. Uh, thank you. Open up the question session. Uh, we have a few questions. Uh, so um, I would like to request the participants uh, to uh, unmute one by one. The first question is by Professor Partha Sharathi Majumdar. Uh, Professor Majumdar, can you ask the question directly? Or should I just read it from the screen? Okay, let me ask uh, directly. Uh, Professor Majumdar is asking if it is related to a particular slide, uh, if PBH and dark matter candidates do merge, so can we consider them as collisionless? Uh, can we consider the dark matter particles as collisionless? Uh, yes, I think that is an excellent approximation. Uh, of course, everything needs to be qualified. Uh, the flow of stars, which are pretty heavy, like mass of the sun, is in fact collisionless uh, on the edge of the universe if it flows through, uh, say, a galaxy, at the density of a galaxy. The flow of winds, which are much less in mass, uh, is collisionless by gravity. Of course, the, the dark matter particles could have other interactions which make it not collisionless, but the gravitational interactions uh, uh, would produce collisionless flow. Did that answer the question? Yeah, 
you, you, you can have uh, dark matter particles that have uh, larger uh, cross sections for interacting and that has been proposed, right? Uh, but the cross sections have to be unusually large for the flow to become collisionless at the densities of a galaxy, of a galactic halo. Okay, so uh, Professor Majumdar is saying that his question was about the primordial black holes. Uh, oh, I'm know. sorry, I misunderstood. Uh, so for primordial black holes, you know, to make the caustics, there are two conditions. The flow must be collisionless and it must be cold. Uh, if you look at black holes, of course, they only have gravitational interactions, right? Uh, and so, uh, it, the, the cross section, the, it only depends upon the mass. If the mass becomes very large, much, less, much bigger than a solar mass, in fact, then the flow becomes collision less, so collision full by gravity. I don't know exactly how big, but it is of order 10 to the five solar masses or some mass like that. And whether the uh, primordial black holes are cold, you have to tell me because you have to tell me how they are produced. Of course, if they're produced primordial, I guess they are cold. Uh, but I I'm, I'm actually don't know much about this, sorry. Okay, we can move to the next question by Professor Das Gupta. Uh, yeah. uh, so he's asking, could the ripples that are seen around the galaxy that has captured another be caused by stars following a wave-like disturbance in a fuzzy dark matter halo? Ah, uh, so you, um, you think the, um, the shells could be a manifestation of waves in a fuzzy dark matter halo. Uh, okay, I think that's a very interesting idea. I, I, uh, the wavelength would be very large, I think. And usually the, the, um, the wavelengths in fuzzy dark matter in a halo of order kiloparsec. And then the mass has to be quite small uh, of order, I don't know, 10 to the minus 21 EV. So if the shells around this elliptical are much bigger if they're re representing the Compton, so not, not the Compton, the De Broglie wavelength of the fuzzy dark matter, I think they would be on scales of 100 kiloparsecs. So the mass would have to be really very small. This is my fast response. I'm sorry, uh, it may be quite inaccurate. <laughs> so uh, it's an interesting idea, interesting idea. Okay, we go to the next question then by Shondipan Sendupta. Uh, could this caustic simply be studied using Raichaudhuri's equation? If yes, could shear on rotation like deformation in the phase space for such fluid lines can be be important in this particular context? Okay, so let me uh, just again. If yes, could shear or rotation like deformations in the phase space for such fluid lines be important in this particular context? Uh, actually, I did not quite understand the first line. Can caustics be studied using what? I didn't understand the word. Using, using Raichaudhuri's equations. Oh, Raichaudhuri equations. Uh, is that what? Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, um, can you explain uh, a bit more if you uh, can come here on mute? Okay, so is this uh, similar to studying uh, ordinary matter, like when you study taste particles going through geodesics and whether they focus or not, and, or whether they are executing some other exotic motions like rotation or, or uh, in a shear like motion. So I'm just trying to see whether it's similar to ordinary matter going through geodesics. In your yes. case, it's dark matter through fluid lines, uh, or is there something non-trivial going on here, uh, no, which no, is not it, it ordinary is particles? So this is completely trivial uh, in the sense that I think when you're talking about uh, particles following geodesics, you're assuming the particles is 
just uh, purely moving under the effect of gravity. And that is precisely what is assumed here because uh, that's collisionless, so-called collisionless flow. If you uh, study geodesics and the particles follow geodesics, but the particles are made of say water, then of course the, they don't follow the geodesics because of the interactions of the water molecules with themselves. So we are precisely in the case where we, we are saying such interactions are absent. And in the case of dark matter, this is supposed to be a good, uh, a, a good assumption. Okay. I don't know if this answers your question, yeah. but it is, it is very much similar to the motion of the study of geodesic motion and the study of uh, envelopes in the trajectories of cold geodesic motion is the same, right? It's the same thing. Thank you. Okay, uh, Professor Raghavan and Rajan has a question. Uh, yeah. So does the observational evidence for the presence of caustics um, favor any particular candidate of dark matter? Does it exclude certain candidates of dark matter? Oh, is that Raghu? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, of course, um, yes, there's a long story about this. Um, I just thought I'd stop here because I thought I could hold emphasized uh, that there are caustics and that they are a tool and they can be useful. But in fact, the tool I think is more useful than I ever thought. And this really relates to this question and Raghu knows he's just setting me up, you know, uh, that the caustic rings show that the dark matter falls in with rotation. But actually, Ordinary cold dark matter has no rotation. It may have angular momentum, but the velocity field is irrotational. And I claim that the, uh, therefore, the dark matter must be axions because axions, they actually acquire rotation by Bose-Einstein condensation. And so, uh, in fact, I think the evidence for caustic rings is evidence that the dark matter is axions. And I cannot say what kind of axions. It has to be axion or axon-like part, axion -like particle. Uh, yes, so thank you, Raghu, for the opportunity to, <laughs> to state this. Okay, Rishi has a question, Rishi. Rishi, you wanted to ask a question. You haven't written the question, but you can unmute and ask yourself. If Rishi is not here, we can go to the, go to Sri Hari. Hi. Uh, oh, Rishi is here. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I have a question about. I think someone also wrote in the chat about. So you are predicting that uh, some particular velocity distribution around our location in the Milky Way, right? The uh, yes, distribution yes. of dark matter. I think this will have very important consequences for the direct dark matter detection experiments. Yes. So right now, the interpretation of those experiments depend on what distribution, uh, velocity distribution you assume for the dark matter. In general, people assume some isotropic distribution, but yes, you are. If caustics is uh, correct, there are caustics, then there will be, I think, particular flows in particular directions in our location. And that should change the, you know, uh, the interpretation of these experiments. Uh, yes, of course, WIMP doc, uh, uh, no one has seen a signal yet, but you're co completely correct. And of course, that was the original motivation for this study. Even the upper limits will change. The upper limits that you deduce uh, from these yes. experiments, they will change if the velocity. Is, uh, yes, you're right, you're right. Because in fact, the density of this big flow is uh, of course, we didn't this, uh, know this a few years ago, but according to this latest paper, is uh, 40 times the density usually attributed to the local dark matter. With, however, an uncertainty, there's a large uncertainty on the density because it's very sensitive to all location relative to the caustic. So the uncertainty is a factor of two. 
but even 40 divided by two is 20 times larger than what is usually assumed. It's not just density, right? Because the flux of the dark matter depends on velocity also. So if you are predicting a different velocity, then that will also change the flux which is coming on the detector. You're right. The velocity uh, magnitude, so the speed, is very typical. It's of order 300 kilometers per second. Uh, but it has a very special direction. It's actually pointing in the, the local, uh, the velocity relative to the Earth is pointing in the direction of galactic rotation, whereas usually people assume the opposite. So it's diametrically opposite, yes. yes. It will also change, for example, the annual modulation signal that you explain. Yes, it is opposite. Okay, we can go to Srihari's question. Uh, Srihari, uh, you want to ask yourself? Or... Okay, so let me just read. Uh... Hello. Okay, yeah. Please. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Ah, okay, so just I had the same question about uh, direct detection limits, but I would only like to uh, add to that question and ask you based on what you just said, whether we already know whether we are in an over density or an under density based on the observational evidences that you uh, show. Do we already know something about, uh, you know, whether we are in an over dense region or under dense region here on Earth? So I claim that we are in a way very much an over density. So the density is much larger, say, on Earth and say in the, uh, next to the sun uh, than is usually assumed. It's not, incon it's not inconsistent with this, uh, the usual statement because the usual statement is based upon uh, the rotation, the rotation speed of our galaxy, and is valid on a scale of kiloparsec. Kiloparsec is 10 to the 21 centimeter. The size of this uh, caustic is of order uh, 100 parsec. So uh, it is much, much smaller, and it is consistent. So then all the limits that we infer would become much stronger. I think you said 40 times is about the over density. So we are actually will be looking at some big, uh, you know, like stronger limits from what we can. Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that does answer the question. Okay, thank you everyone. Okay, for the questions and if there are no more questions, uh, Let's thank uh, Professor Zakivi once more for the talk and patiently answering all the questions.